Great, thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, what a pleasure to be here, I must say. Um, uh, I don't know if you guys know, know Andy over there. He's our developer relations guy. Um, but he contacted me a couple of weeks ago and said, hey, there's this conference in Cape Town. Don't you want to come out and talk? And you, know, you don't much, need much of an excuse to head down here. So here I am. And uh, it's been great so far, and I'm really looking forward to tomorrow. Um, and looking forward to sharing some of uh, Street View with you, which is what I've been on for the last few years. Uh, originally South African, as you can tell, um, I moved over and did a, a PhD in, in, in the US uh, and then ended up uh, in, in Street View um, doing uh, obviously a lot of coding, but uh, more applying some control and estimation work. So I figured what I'd do here is give you an overview of Street View, how it grew, how it scaled, some of the issues that we ran into and some of the solutions that they came up with and then discuss some of the larger Google um, scale infrastructure that we tend to use, uh, at least on the inside, on a daily basis to try and um, wrangle all this data into place. So, um, yeah, interrupt me with questions if you want. There's a lot of pictures, so, you know, I might not comment on something, but if you want to know about it, just, just raise your hand. So if you don't know Street View, it's this process of driving these cars around. This is our kind of quintessential platform. It has this camera soccer ball thing up top, some laser sensors. Um, I'll cover more details later. But just trying to drive it everywhere. So we have a total of 5 million unique miles driven, uh, 20 petabytes of imagery data. And our main client is uh, through Maps, where uh, they're serving 1 billion uh, monthly actives, so we certainly have scale. This is actually, these, this data is a little bit old. I think it's about a year and a half. I took it from a presentation just before Apple released their Maps product. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, <laughs> And so uh, we, we, we've, been, we've been growing since then. Um, we, we've almost got a, a it's, I think it's just over a year um, a doubling of, of data. Um, so we, we, we've collected a bunch more since then. OK, pop quiz. And I have uh, giveaways, these little Android um, USB sticks. What was the most visited panorama from 2009 to 2011? And OK, Eiffel Tower. Sorry, what square? Times Square. Times Square. Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon. Golden, Gate Bridge. Golden Gate Bridge. Any others? Google Flex. Google Flex, OK. Table Mountain, OK. <laughs> I think we have a winner. It's Kirsten Bosch, <laughs> which, is, which is amazing, right? So the real reason was uh, who, was, who had the, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> Here's another one. <laughs> yeah. uh, so it was on the, the front page of our Street View gallery. So anyone who went and searched Street View and ended up on maps, this was the quintessential image that they were handed. Um, but still, source of pride nonetheless. So it was quite nice to walk by there earlier today. Uh, anyway, so yeah, let's go back to the beginning. Started um, kind of two, um, two, two impetus for it. One was Larry literally driving around with a video camera saying, uh, hey, I think the world wants to see other parts of the world. So he took this, this film, handed it to some guys at Stanford and said, can't you turn this into some sort of immersive explore the world experience? Um, and those guys were influenced somewhat by this Seamless City um, artist who, unfortunately, I've forgotten his name right now, but you should check out his site, seamlesscity.com, uh, where he was going along with an SLR camera, taking multiple images, taking them back to Photoshop um, and, uh, and stitching them together. And so you get these multi-perspective images where, so you can see down this street, you can see both sides of the street, and over here you can also see that side of the street. So he's found a seam in there where he can seamlessly stitch them together. And so um, it's, it's great, right? Um, and so they were kind of influenced by that, and they said, what, what can we do to make this scale? Because he was doing 30 miles, and it took him a long time. Um, so we're going we're gonna to scale it. And so they developed some of the requirements for this. So. Uh, they were going to go with high resolution at the time, one megapixel cameras, multiple exposures to do with, with different lighting conditions and whatnot. Very high frame rate, because the plan was we're going to drive along and take a strip image 
and then stitch it with another strip and another strip and another strip. So instead of taking one image and like displaying it as a panorama and stitching it with another big image, there are going to be lots of multiple little strips. So it had to be really high, high frame rate and you need to know how far away a surface was so that you could do the stitching. Because if, if stuff is at different depths, it's, uh, it's difficult to decide uh, what the parallax error is. So we needed depth information, which meant lasers on board, and we needed sensors and IMU and whatnot. So it needed a lot of power, um, lots of computes, power and storage. And so this was the very first attempt. So these were the Stanford guys that came along. They were interning at Google, um, and this was the second car on the, on the um, Stanford DARPA challenge. So the first one was Stanley that was doing the autonomous driving, and this was their backup and some of the equipment. So you see these two laser sensors up here that were getting the depth information. Here's the single camera. Um, and, then, uh, and then here's the hackery that was going on in the car. I mean, it was very much like grad student, 20% time stuff. Um, and they found that you know, they needed more power, and then these things were freaking people out when they were driving them down the road. So they installed a custom power supply, <laughs> <laughs> and then a custom enclosure. Um, and it, it, you know, no one noticed, uh, so this worked pretty well. Um, and it got data, so um, this is the output. Um, across the top is long strip. So this is multiple city blocks worth of this panorama. And if the road is nice and smooth, you got really nice smooth imagery. But there were issues here. So this is what happens when you go over a couple bumps. You get these things like kind of stitched together in this really wonky way, which was an artifact of having that push broom style photography. Um, but this was enough to, to put together some mocks and justify moving forward, because you know, the road is sometimes smooth. So um, you know, this is kind of what you see today. A, a local listing of sorts, a position on the map, the road highlighted, and then a corresponding image. And perhaps a precursor to some of our logging and timestamping issues, you'll notice that the image does not correspond to the local listing. <laughs> but um, yeah, anyway, so this was early mocks. And enough to say, okay, we're actually going to build something and get some funding um, and, and make this like, really larger scale. And so we started building this monster vehicle as it's, as it's become now. So Generation 1 had uh, 10, total 10 cameras, the ones that you saw earlier, uh, mounted there. They're, they're all streaming the 600 megabits a second worth of, of, of data, and so we need to log that to disk. And it was super critical that we had all the data, so they wanted to have a duplicate. So we had two disks for each camera. So a total of now 20 disks uh, required to log. Um, so you needed a server to, to handle all of that. Um, and there were uh, six laser sensors uh, wrapped around the side. So there was a hell of a lot of logging going on. So you needed a mini data center, which is what we ended up with here. Literally went into the data center and pulled out a rack um, with one of the production machines um, and, and mounted it in the car and thought, great, we're ready to go. Uh, but ran into vibration issues. So, well, let's load pneumatic supports on the bottom. <laughs> um, and they had to do a bunch of other modifications. So they added a, a wheel encoder onto the, the rear axle, replaced it. It needed clearly a lot more power, so they um, uh, replaced the alternator, the fire truck alternator. Um, and, you know, it, this, this was kind of a nightmare, but it, it worked. And, um, and we were able to launch some data. So started with five cities back in 2007, um, a lot of collection in San Francisco and just a couple of collections elsewhere. Um, at this time, the, the, the notion of scale was not actually that big. We were thinking of collecting a couple of small areas, like high value sort of areas. And so even though that, that platform was um, you know, less than optimal, um, it, was, it was seen that, okay, we could kind of scale this because at least we can just drive down the street and collect the data. Um, and, um, and so they thought, okay, there are some stuff we need to deal with. They started building the second car, uh, which was going to be a modification, better reliability and whatnot. And around about this time, the Google Maps folks who were trying to build the, our own maps, so Ground Truth Project, if you've heard of that, saw this stuff and said, wow, this is great. We really want this. Um, because it can help us with the maps. We can see streets, we can see intersections, we can see names, et cetera. And so suddenly they said, we want, we want scale, and we want large scale. We don't, we don't want um, necessarily all these, these fancy computer vision uh, tricks you were going to do. We just want to see images everywhere. And that begat version uh, two, 
which is like a complete rewrite in a way. And so this is maybe somewhat of another uh, lesson on scale that at least we learned in this project was, you know, when you find a product and you find a purpose, uh, like dive into it um, and, and make the most of it and don't necessarily hang on to the stuff you'd left behind earlier. So no big mounts anymore, no lasers. Um, the idea was you could, you could take this thing, go into a city, strap it on top of a car, a rental, and drive around the city and do the collection. This camera is a commercial Ladybug 2 camera, um, much lower band, uh, bandwidth. You could just write straight to disk. So now we only needed one disk. So there was one Pentium machine stuck in the back, like <laughs> Velcroed to the, to the floor. Um, and we had a commercial uh, GPS and IMU solution. And the driver just had to get in the car, turn it on and start driving. And this, this was great. Cut down, super simple, and, and we scaled a lot with it. So. Um, the, the, this, this grew r really, really well. Um, but we started seeing so Im imagery issues. Oh, another thing I left off on the previous slide, we at that point gave up on that push broom style. And now we just went to the panorama thing that you see. So in that earlier image, you see the, that camera there. There's essentially four or five webcams pointed in different directions. They take a snapshot. We stitch them together along the boundaries. Um, but it was, it was really cheap, um, and so we had these image quality issues. Um, uh, the, the sensors being blown out by direct sunlight. Um, it wasn't waterproof, um, and various other things. Um, stitching issues. <laughs> 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 so as a consequence of the motion, um, other stitching issues. <laughs> uh, and this then, okay, now we had, a, we had, a, we had someone who was paying us, and, and they were growing like crazy, and so uh, we started um, actually building a, a really robust system. So this is our kind of generation three, um, where we realized it was very nice to have these lasers, so we brought them back. We addressed the issues with the, the poor camera quality at the top, so these, this was now our own camera with uh, off-the-shelf off the cameras, but um, our own assembly. Uh, there was, I think, seven or so around the side, and then a, a, a fisheye lens across the top. Uh, better mounts onto the car, so actual proper roof rack. Um, and, uh, and actually, we, we went with black cars because we didn't want there to be like uh, color influences in the imagery by having this like colored platform underneath you. So we thought black was the best. But again, a, a black car rolling around with lasers and cameras on the top. <laughs> So, yeah, so now when you see the cars, we've gone completely the opposite way. Um, and I think, oh yeah, another quiz question. Um, where was generation, so this was launched in, in Europe. Where was generation four launched? Oh, okay, that's too easy. I've given it away on the rendezvous. I mean, not that uh, thing. Okay, so two people. Yeah, so South Africa. Um, and uh, maybe I can give away some more if anyone can spot the differences. There's two main differences. <laughs> there are three main differences. <laughs> so, yeah, so, oh, okay, there were, I am only interested in two differences. <laughs> so, yeah, it was, it was the Prius, so we could hack into the can a lot easier, um, but the, the, the main thing was that we, um, okay, I don't know who these are supposed to go to, there was only one here and someone there and uh, someone there. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so we added in these rear support stays um, because of all the potholes. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, and uh, yeah, and then we replaced this box at the top um, and this was now actually our own uh, logging device. So this had an accelerometer in it so it measured how the car was moving and a rotation device. Um, and we had found that we, we kind of wanted to take more control of our own destiny. Um, and this has been another lesson in scale uh, in, in general, that when you get big enough, you, you end up taking control of your own destiny. And, and in our case, it, it's worked out uh, really well. So um, yeah, that was um, an iteration that did well here. And now we've moved on to this one, which is what we're driving everywhere, which is the one I, I showed you earlier. So um, it's got this soccer ball style camera on the top, 15 cameras, um, a total of 65 megapixels. Um, it's a rolling shutter style camera, so each pixel is exposed individually, and we try and time it from like the back forward to the front, so that along the seams where one camera meets the other, 
those pixels are exposed at, I mean, we try, uh, roughly the same time, so that as you're moving down the road, they are looking at the same thing. So when we stitch them, you see a nice even, even stitch along that boundary. Um, and uh, yeah, and this is, this, is, this is what we've been driving uh, just about everywhere. We'll change the mast heights um, depending on the country. So this is Japan, where they tend to have smaller streets. And with that normal mast height, you would be looking over walls. And um, it wasn't good for uh, privacy uh, stuff. Uh, <laughs> I'm not, not talking about privacy. Um, <laughs> So there you see the inside of this latest camera, the, the R7, uh, and this was some of the, the construction stuff we were doing. In the early days, we would send out engineers um, to, to wherever it was, uh, in this case, I think it's Amsterdam, and they would arrive there and just do the build and just try and push these things out. Um, the lesson we learned on scale here was just having um, a, a solid um, pipeline bringing in your parts and whatnot, because they would get there and they would short some part, and then it would be, you know, panic trying to trying to resource it. Um, and a funny thing here was these socks where we put over the camera um, to to protect it and whatnot. It's difficult importing textiles into countries, so. Um, just about everything on the car is imported except for the sock, which we had m manufactured locally because of the import restrictions. Um, and now we have like detectors that the driver will drive and forget to take it off, so we'll have to, um, yeah, we warn him <laughs> that. <laughs> so this was great. So this just drove a bunch of expansion. Um, so 2007 to 2009, um, it, it now GT wanted a coverage, so we, we crushed it around the world, really, um, is the US and then around the world. So this is in um, Bavaria somewhere, I think. Um, and then started taking that platform and, and sticking it on other vehicles. So that, that original monster, there's no way you could have ported that thing. But with this more sort of modular design, and I think everyone supports modular designs, we could slap it on other things. So this is a trike. Um, the, the main modification to it, or the significant thing, is we had to have wheel encoders. Um, so this really helps get a, a distance measurement um, uh, that's independent of the GPS, which is, turns out to be really useful um, for, for serious stuff uh, and for playful stuff. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, people start doing stuff with your product, right? You're like, hey, it's got wheel encoders, so it'll roll along the ground, and we can measure how far it moves. So the operations say, great, let's stick it on a boat. And <laughs> so this is in the Tokyo Harbor. Um, and then this was around the Amazon Basin, sorry, Amazon River, uh, where they strapped it to the roof and, and drove it along. And um, in the beginning, they knew, they knew we wanted wheel encoder information. So they, they tried to stick it on wheels and have someone ride the bike <laughs> at the appropriate speed. <laughs> Um, but you know, this is this is somewhat a lesson in in the scaling as well. In that, um, and then maybe it's maybe it's embedded in Google culture. I hope it is. In, uh, I expect it is elsewhere. That this was pushing pushing the limits. As was this thing. This was a new platform we developed We're on a backpack. I'll cover it later. But you know, just kind of set the crazy goal and then just hack it together and get it to work. And now, you know, I'm sitting back in the office and I receive this collect and they're like, hey, this is really important. Um, and it, it sort of forced us and focused us on, on something. And so, you know, it's like what the earlier talk was saying about setting, setting challenges where you feel like you're contributing something meaningful. Um, this has really been driving our, our group forward. Um, uh, this was going uh, around the tracks, trains in, in Switzerland. Uh, sticking it on a, a snowmobile. This was for the 2010 Vancouver uh, Olympics, where you know, <laughs> a snowmobile uh, camera system designed in sunny California on rollers in the parking lot gets to gets to Vancouver, and the hard drives won't spin up because they're frozen. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we wanted to go towards a backpack. This was kind of been a long-term goal. You can see we're eager to get these wheel encoders again. Um, and so this, these were some of the earlier prototypes uh, because they wanted to take it outdoors, indoors, and, and whatnot. And a couple of years later, we actually got, uh, got to the stage, which is another way of inspiring your employees to say, if you behave well, we'll take you hiking in the Grand Canyon. Um, and so we, uh, so it's the, same, it's the same unit. It's shrunk down a little bit. Um, actually, something I missed earlier, which you guys would be interested in, we have about a two terabyte cache uh, uh, memory flash. Uh, just underneath the camera, and on the car, um, it's it's moving it's moving pretty fast, and we do speed-dependent uh, sampling 
uh, of imagery. And it's actually moving too fast to write it all to disk. So we cache it in that terabyte flash there. And then when we stop at the traffic light or something, uh, it can catch up because then we, we stop the sampling. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's pretty cute. And, and then people say, why don't you just film video? And, and apparently the reason is it's a lot easier to get a photography license than it is to get a filming license. So, you know, one meter sampled images instead of full video cameras. Uh, and then we, we strapped it on a boat um, and, and, and paddled it down the river. Uh, we've got an indoor collection platform. Obviously, this has no GPS, but it's the same fundamental system. Um, apparent issues, again, because when stuff is closer in the image, you get uh, you get issues with stitching. So this was in the Iraq um, museum around the Iraq War time, where they were concerned about it being looted. And so, what a better place to test your your um, prototype hardware than than an Iraq museum during a war? So those guys went down to do that. Um, this is um, a nice, really nice story in scale. So. We have launched this data, but it was actually collected by this Caitlin Institute, who I think are an Australian outfit, who were documenting um, ocean loss and whatnot, uh, and, and, and swimming these things uh, along coral reefs. And they had the data, they had this really sweet camera, um, and, uh, and, but they wanted scale, and they didn't have the serving infrastructure or the resources, and so they contacted us, and we, we stuck it in our, um, our serving, and uh, it's, it's, it's a pretty fun project. And okay, so this is all the collection stuff. Now we get to the actual data upload. Um, and so we've got two basic systems. One is um, a data center upload, which looks suspiciously like an Amazon data center, which may have shown up in an earlier presentation. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I appreciate Amazon's support for our services. Um, <laughs> Uh, so this is, we, it's, it's, it's so much data, so much imagery data that it's better to pack, it, pack the disks in a box and ship them to a data center and then we'd upload them from a rack here. Um, a, nift, a neat story there is we'd saturate the network links so badly that we had to configure them um, to, to just be free flow instead of TCP because the TCP acts were getting uh, blocked and then dropped and, and we, were, um, we were too saturated to essentially stream anything. Uh, and this is now uh, what we do in, in places where it's maybe too difficult to ship to a data center. Um, so this is for like regional collects or some countries don't allow you to take a disk over a border, um, but they'll um, but you can ship the data over the border. So um, yeah, om nom nom, Cookie Monster eats anything you give him. <laughs> uh, okay, great, now we get to what my, my team does. Um, I limited the slides here, but uh, essentially, it's a, a sensor combination issue. So this is once the data is now in our data center, and uh, we we can now run uh, these processes on it. So downtown areas, you can imagine, GPS is pretty terrible, but we have all those other sensors on board, and so we run this uh, combined optimization problem that takes into account the two GPS receivers, wheel speed, um, accelerometer, gyro. Um, and uh, we include terrain information that we get from Google Earth. Um, we do some structure for motion stuff. I'll cover that later. But we do loop closing. Um, and we can knock it down from sort of 30 to 50 meters worth of error to um, one to two meters uh, absolute error, which, uh, and, and relative error is, is even less. So we're, we're pretty happy with that. Um, but a comment on scale here, which is really interesting, is that we have a lot of data. And um, you should not be afraid to use that data to both calibrate um, and then um, uh, exercise controls in your system. So we aggressively throw away data now. So in our optimization uh, framework, you, know, you can throw away outliers. Um, and we're pretty aggressive about it, that we have enough good data to calibrate everything and then just uh, kind of ignore the, the bad data and, and characterize it. Because you know sometimes we still get it wrong. <laughs> and uh, you end up in the lake. So, uh, yeah, but now, we, we, as I say, we've got enough data that we can, um, we can detect these, these cases now, which is, which is really quite re rewarding. Um, and then another team that gets hold of the data at this point is the privacy people, and, and they go in and, and blur faces, they blur number plates, um, and you know, I, this, is this, <laughs> this is the slide I felt like a bit of a suit putting in. Protecting users' privacy and preserving trust is of paramount importance. And it is, but um, you know, regardless of your political or disposition towards Google, we will blur your face. <laughs> <laughs> and we also respect horses' privacy. <laughs> anyway, so uh, another level of the, so you, you've seen that laser data that, that I keep mentioning we have. So what do we do with that? So um, here you can see the car has traveled down the middle of the road here. It has 
a laser sensor on either side, kind of fanning out and getting a vertical scan of the of the buildings. And so you can make out the facade of this building and the facades around there. Um, and so this gives us an idea of what the geometry is around the, the car. Uh, this image on the right, and it's a pity you can't see it uh, quite as well, but um, this is running uh, some computer vision algorithms over the images, detecting salient features uh, in, in the environment, and then trying to detect those over subsequent panoramas. So any one of these points we might have seen over two or three or four or ten or however many uh, subsequent panoramas. And then you can triangulate its location. So these are actually points triangulated in the world uh, through uh, computer vision and using the, the pose that we have uh, of the car. Um, and this is uh, used for a couple things, but the, the one that we that will highlight here um, is creating these depth maps. So this is the, the, the image that you would, you would get served, which would be wrapped in a sphere to get, to get the panorama. Um, but this is the corresponding simplified depth map. So um, you can kind of see the mapping between you know, what's up close uh, and then, and, then uh, and so forth. Uh, and we use that to then draw, if you view Street View, um, this, this pancake on the ground here, as well as the rectangle uh, on, the, on the walls. So it allows for smart navigation. Um, and we also use it for then, uh, if we drive down that road again, you can correspond um, a, fa a facade between the two times you've driven down the run and, and snap the two to have that facade agree because you, you assume that the building hasn't moved. Um, <laughs> we, actually, we have, in San Francisco, we have um, uh, plate tectonics uh, differences that we have to account for between the earlier collects in 2000, um, 2008 and the collects today. Okay, um, so that's, that's Street View. Um, and now a, a couple of final little things on it, I guess. Um, keep collections simple. So um, you notice the, the, the progression of those cars from that super complicated thing, keeping it totally simple, um, ignoring some of, some of your users' requests. You know, that was a satisfy everyone solution. Once we had a client and we had something to work on, we, we really ran with it. Um, and, and came up with, with, that, with that version 2, which then allowed us to grow. Uh, log everything all the time. This has saved us uh, so many times. Um, you know, you, you can't log what you, I mean, you can't manage what you can't measure. Uh, pretty obvious stuff. Um, we do optimize our driving routes, so a uh, huge traveling salesman problem, like drive every road in the world. Um, and, uh, and then that gets handed down to the driver so he can see the route that he's going to follow. Uh, I asked the serving infrastructure guys, hey, I'm giving this talk. What could I tell, uh, what could I tell them about our serving in infrastructure and how we're so clever? And, and the guy said, well, you start with $100 million worth of serving equipment. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, but so we, we, we uh, tile the panoramas. Um, and this is the one thing uh, he really highlighted uh, was stateless front end and back end. So, you know, so many users, so many load balances, so many services coming up and down and sessions changing and et cetera. Uh, and another interesting thing we've learned is that uh, coverage was actually more important than, than key areas. So we try and cover a whole country as compared to uh, just like a city. Because um, people tend to actually look mostly at the stuff that's near them, uh, as it turns out. Just like you download Google Earth, and you can see the whole Earth, but you go and look at your house. <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, so now I was going to move on to some just Google scale things. Um, some of these stuff you would have heard of, um, and you know, I, I'm a user of these internal services, um, and you know, I just highlight one or two things. Um, so just on the straight development cycle that we have, and how we've been able to scale it up and have so many people working on code and whatnot. Um, integration tests and unit tests. This is uh, one of the guys in my group has this little saying: write a test, find a bug. Um, uh, somebody earlier m mentioned this. Um, you know, test the hell out of stuff. Um, we have our own uh, engineers write tests. So I write code and then I, I test it. And someone reviewing that code um, will not approve it until, until I have the test uh, to accompany it. Um, as many of you know, we develop off uh, a single branch. So, you know, you develop your test and then you submit code back into that branch. And if you break it, you fix it. Um, so you never end up with a situation where one group has their code that branched nine months ago and now it's just too complicated to merge it back because, you know, they would never launch anything um, uh, at all. 
uh, and code reviews, uh, lots of peer reviews of code. Um, and you know, you hand it to someone who knows the language well, um, and you hand it to someone who knows the architecture of that, that code really well. And in general, if it's too complicated to review, it's too complicated to submit. So um, you break these things up into manageable things that are, that are coherent for a reviewer. Um, OK, so I guess you've, uh, how many people have heard of this Google file system? I imagine. OK, great. Enough people that I can uh, be, be superficial and you still think it's great. Um, so this was an early system that we built, um, or that uh, Sanjay and, and Jeff Dean built, uh, to, to hold our stuff. And it was a distributed file system, like many predecessors, but they based it around these four assumptions. And you know, this is kind of a lesson in scale. See what your domain is, and then don't be afraid to, to sort of buck the norm to meet your demands. So um, failures of the norm, this has been covered a couple times earlier. Um, running on many, many hundreds of and thousands of servers. In the early days, we were buying commodity cheap stuff. We were taking rejects from, um, from companies just to have enough RAM. And so stuff was going to fail a lot. Uh, our files are typically big, so um, we were not optimizing for, s for small files. So I think that it's optimized for like 64 meg files um, and, 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 then, and then bigger on top of that. So you, store, you can store small things, but it n doesn't really uh, scale that well. And this was kind of an insight in many of our stuff. The mutations are mostly ads and, and not overwrites. And so much of our stuff is actually immutable, which um, sounds really crazy. but. Um, but when you sort of design with that up front, um, it, it's actually really, really flexible. Um, and an example of this is kind of embedded in this, in this f final thing, which was um, if you're trying to do too much with your API and try and satisfy everyone's demands and like any possible use case, you, you run into trouble. Um, and so they provide some rather simple API guarantees that clients kind of have to design around. And so a, a, a really interesting thing in this, um, this architecture is that if you issue a, a write request, um, you'll, you'll get told, so you're in the application, you go to this master and it'll tell you where to write it, and then the data goes you know, straight to where it's gonna be written on some chunk server somewhere, that's pretty standard. But it's a um, write at least once semantic guarantee. So you might actually write it multiple times but at least it's written. And this seems like kind of crazy, right? Especially because you can't go back and edit the file. But you know, if you know this as the client, when you're reading it, we have some stuff built into the API that automatically removes the, the duplications because you've got checksums on this, on this data anyway. And so, um, so this allows multiple concurrent f writers to write uh, to the same file abstraction really, really quickly. So in our map producers and our large processes, uh, you can do this stuff in parallel. And um, th that's become just absolutely critical to many of the, the things we run. Uh, big table. I imagine lots of people heard of Big Table as well. Um, I'll quote from the paper. Um, it's a sparse, distributed, persistent, multidimensional sorted map, um, which is which makes you sound clever uh, to say. But uh, here it is. So to just to run it from the back forward. So it's it's a map. So there's a set of keys uh, demarcated, by, demarcated by the the rows. Um, so and then it maps to to values. And so it's multidimensional because we have multiple uh, columns. So uh, multiple columns as well as depth. So anytime you write to a particular cell in this column, um, you get timestamp versions. And so a simple abstract, a simple API they give is how many versions do you want to keep? Just one or, or up to n. Um, and that's that's the basic abstraction. We have on top of these these column things um, locality groups. Um, and this is so you can specify, okay, I want this maybe on disk, or I want it in memory, or um, I want to apply certain rate ACLs to it, or, uh, or whatnot. So it's pretty coarsely managed by that. Um, it's uh, persistent in that it was, it was written to disk, so obviously if you're writing to locality group on disk, it's going to go to disk. But um, the same with the memory, it was actually saved off somewhere. Um, and uh, distributed, so the way it's actually physically implemented is uh, it with, with each row um, being uh, managed by an individu individual tablet server or a tablet server managing multiple uh, rows. And so these, you know, this will be located on one machine, this will be located on, a, on another machine. But because it's a map, the keys are sorted. 
so it makes looking up stuff r pretty easy. So um, you know, a, a request is is a login or whatever it is to to come down to your data, but they're ordered so you can also parse them really quickly. And this was the nature of our jobs that you're typically either just going and get one value or you were doing a streaming type of result, and then you know you just load the tablet and you get all its all its values. Um, uh, the, the lesson that that um, the guys learned from this in terms of scale, it c comes back to that API thing. So in the beginning, they were trying to sort of satisfy everyone's um, requests and they had a pretty comp they had a simple API and then they made it more and more complicated as to trying to lock the whole table and ensure an atomic updates and whatnot. But um, a lesson they learned, and actually you should read the paper, it's stated in there, is that um, they didn't implement that before it was needed. And when they actually saw how users were using the service, they realized that an atomic lock on just a row um, was enough. And so that's what it provides you. So you, you, if you write, you know you're going to get an atomic update of that row, um, but, but no other guarantees. Um, oh, and it's, it's sparse. So it's intended that you would have maybe a couple hundred locality groups, so the top level, but up to hundreds of thousands, uh, millions of, of columns. And you don't have to fill in every value. So. Um, yeah, so, so it can obviously be sparse and it, it doesn't incur any overhead on, um, on, on saving that. Um, yeah, I think that's everything I wanted to say about that. Um, okay, MapReduce. Um, I'm sure you've, pr you've heard of Hadoop. Um, this was the, the precursor. And um, let's read from the paper again. Programming model and associated implementation for processing and generating large data sets. So, Google is, is just built on this, absolutely. It's an underlying computational engine for us. And it can be broken down into a couple relatively simple stages. You have some input. This could be read from that big table. It could be read from uh, a text file. It could be read from you know, proto buffers, it, whatever. But it's sharded in, in some way. Um, and then you have uh, the, 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 the first of two um, workers. So individual map workers will get a couple shards uh, each. And they just take a string input, do some stuff, and emit a key and a value. All strings. Sounds like really like overly simple, but all it requires is that that output is serializable and, and, um, and, and you, can, you can put whatever you want in here. So it's referred to uh, as a mapper. Uh, and it emits these things and it has a key and a value. And this, this uh, shuffle stage here will associate all the keys together and hand those to an individual reducer, which is then this level here, which is again a, a thing that uh, can do a little bit of computation uh, and then generate some output. So super simple. Some input, one layer of computation, emitters uh, that can, can kind of reorder your data, another level of computation and write it out. Uh, all strings. Um, there's some there's some other stuff on here like you can you can do some prelim some optimizations on on gathering keys before they leave a map worker and stuff but that's essentially it um, super super uh, powerful and um, like Google is absolutely built on it but one thing that you get here is that if you want to now run another stage you have to take this stuff uh, take this output re-engineer it as an our input to another stage and it became a bit of a, it rapidly becomes a pain. Um, and so introducing Flume, which is, um, I think f uh, there was a paper on Flume Java released uh, say about two years ago and it, it streamlines making um, a large pipelines of these sort of MapReduce processes. And it does it with this abstraction of an object called a, a P collection that is templated then on your individual whatever it is. And the only requirement here again is that this foo be serializable so that you can send it over the wire. So we will use uh, protocol buffers uh, extensively um, or you know, if, if you really need to, you, you, you make a class or something that's, that's serializable. Hands it to some process uh, and it'll output another P collection, um, but now of maybe type bar or, or, or whatever type could be foo or, or et cetera. Um, and uh, and then and then it'll so so you you construct your pipeline in terms of these large operations. So this is could be thought of as a map reduce. You're taking this distributed collection of objects. You're running a process on each individual object, and you're getting another set of individual objects. And so in this example here, you have some input. 
uh, and it you know it's generating that's the process some output another process and output um, and then this optimization process runs over um, your your structure once you defined it and sees that okay there's no dependencies on these intermediate values so why don't I just lump them all into one thing and and output it so um, it's kind of the evolution of MapReduce and all the cool kids are using it so uh, so yeah that's that's um, this become really really powerful now. Um, um, okay, now going a little bit back towards Street View, this recapture, um, we use this extensively, and I just thought it was kind of kind of fun to to throw in there in terms of a scale thing. So, this started with Google Books, where we were struggling to translate some of the words. So we'd take a photo, uh, and then run OCR on it, but wouldn't quite be able to identify everything. And so we came up with this recapture, which I'm sure you've all seen on a website, but for for you know trying to log into a site, um, it's on hundreds of thousands of sites. Uh, but if you don't know how it works, we only know what one of these values are. And so we ask the user to you know, enter both. And he's giving us a transcription of what the second value is. So in the OCR thing, they would be transcribing the text for us. Um, here you can see street view numbers, which we've been throwing in. And um, look out for a paper next week uh, about what we've been doing with this. But um, you know, you're always trying to get training data for your models, and this is suddenly a massive uh, uh, training set. Um, but yeah, so you can enter one and, and not the other. So a, a, a common response would be 3522345, screw you, Google. <laughs> 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 and you're still logging. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so this is, this is great. This is a crowdsourcing thing. It's on hundreds of thousands of sites. They get millions and millions of detections uh, and, and transcriptions a day. Um, and like I say, there's a, a paper coming out next week that'll have some, some fantastic results on, on how we've been using that. But we still have bugs. <laughs> so uh, yeah, after all of this, you know, there's just these crazy faults. And this was what I was saying earlier. If you, if you can't log these things, you can't ha know how to measure them. Um, and... Uh, <laughs> And more bugs. And just questions, like, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> <laughs> so this is a kitchen in, in Norway, and we drove by, and they were waiting. And, and clearly for a while, right? There's an umbrella. So he was, <laughs> anyway, that's it. So I'll take your questions, please. Cool. Thanks, Craig. Any questions? Lots of questions. I'll make running. Hi, I got two questions about the Street View thing. Yeah. First of all, Google is very, uh, as a search engine, so why don't you incorporate some of the images that Google Image Search picks up that have geolocation data? And then the second one is, given an arbitrary photo, why can't we look in Google's like repo of millions of, video, of uh, images for where it is in the world? So there's a couple types of questions. There's, there's great questions like this for which I have answers. Um, yeah, so on the, on the first one, uh, we're starting to surface those images when you do local search. So if you search for a business, uh, we can associate a, a view code and then that we've geolocated, so a geocode with that business. And so we'll display it in, in the right-hand panel if you do a, a search for, say, a restaurant or something. So it's, it's showing up there. Um, we also export them into Google+. Plus. So if you're doing like a place pages search or something like that, they show up there. Um, and on the images thing, if you go into the search bar and you drag and drop your image into the, the search bar, it'll search that image. No, I mean like my OK. Uh, so you can... You so there's the, the, the Google Goggle Star thing that you take a picture on your phone and it'll match it and if it comes up with a recognition, it'll say, uh, you know, I think you're here. Um, we're trying to, with this Views project, to automatically geolocate them for you. So, you know, we, we pick up w where you are and place them on a map and whatnot. Um, but I think I'm maybe missing your question. So you, you can take an image and do like an image-based search on it. Um, and we, and that's manifested in the goggles sort of product as well as doing the search online. Um, and in terms of geolocating it, your question is? Yeah. Yeah. 
and place you in real time on your phone? Yeah. Yeah, they should do that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's no reason, because we match it against the Eiffel Tower, and we definitely have uh, a geocode for that Eiffel Tower. In fact, there's, there's some stuff, and if you've browsed around on the, on the new Google Maps, um, actually, I should have commented on these little guys along the bottom, but on the new Google Maps, there's that imagery bar along the bottom that you can kind of explore, and some of those are photo tours, where we've taken all the photos we have of an area that we've then geo geolocated and run uh, a bundling adjustment on them and generated nice 3D models so you kind of get a full 3D experience, you can move around in it. Um, and so we're certainly learning that information, so yeah, that'll be fun. Oh, Cool. Question over this side? Uh, hello. Um, in the big table slide, you had a t column address with address.proto. Can you query inside that? Or yeah, so there's there's um, you can you can search for predicates on columns and rows, but you actually have to parse the individual value in the cell. Okay. You would you would have it returned to you, and then you would you would parse them. Um, but that would be a pretty typical input, a pretty typical input to a MapReduce, where you want to then uh, just filter those things. And so that first mapper would be your filter to say only give me these values, and then shuffle and Hi. Uh, sorry, I just want to ask, how does this actually benefit uh, developers, for example, uh, Android developers? We have how an API. Yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what, Street View in general? Or? Yes. Um, so w w we want um, developers to use it in their products. So seriously, we, we have that API. Um, we use it for uh, generating our own maps, so it improves our geolocation, it improves our maps product. Um, it provides uh, imagery to associate with with um, with businesses and locations, um, and uh, we've seen some pretty compelling use cases where people have taken the Street View API and used it in an advertising campaign or something like that. So um, there was one where I think it was um, VW was um, had a little competition for people to uh, identify and locate all the VW uh, cars in in Street View imagery, and there was some prize for that. Um, there's uh, tourism boards who have set up uh, websites that you know showcase their area using the Street View thing. Um, there's business opportunities. We have an indoor photographer thing as well as um, this Views product, which if you search Google Views, uh, it's ability for users and photographers to upload 3D panoramas and create their own sort of Street View experience. And so we can um, we approve certain photographers to do that. Um, but you know, actually, it's it's open to the world now, and so people are making little businesses around that, supplementing their um, uh, uh, supplementing their photography business or starting something new. Um, and uh, and you're gonna have to speak to Andy as well. He's right there. <laughs> yeah. For that recapture that yeah. you had up earlier to identify numbers that you had in maps, or I mean from Street View, and then you said people will type in the number, and then not a very nice thing after that. Yeah. Um, do you? kind of try and detect what the number is beforehand and then you know you've got some kind of learning algorithm that has some idea what it is and then you kind of compare that to what people to put in so that you can yeah. Yeah. compensate for outliers. Yeah, there's, there's that and then, um, and then they try and observe the behavior of the user. So um, there's stuff like time between keystrokes, entering the box, um, browsing behavior um, and that sort of stuff. So yeah, there was a bit of an arms race um, a while ago in which um, uh, people were finding ways around it. Um, it's, th there's an audio option, and people were passing the audio um, and able to identify it from that and automatically fill it in. Um, and there's, there's a pretty fantastic presentation. Um, Black Hat, I think, is, is the security conference for hackers. And um, these guys had a paper as to how they'd, how they'd broken it using the, the voice command. And, and I mean, fairly or unfairly, we patched it uh, just an hour or two before their presentation, having seen the paper. <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, they were they were drunk actually presenting. Um, but yeah, so so it, it's it's gone beyond just the straight enter the numbers um, and uh, and see if you get it right. Cool. Yeah. Great. Let's give Craig a round of applause.